So regardless of what point you start from, most religious discussions boil down to one issue. Where is the dividing line? Between you and me, where is the dividing line? Between truth and error, where is the dividing line? Between what is essential in religion and what is not essential? Between salvation and between loss of salvation? You know, we like to dance around this issue because the trend in our society today is to be inclusive, tolerant, open-minded. For example, our educational system is moving towards a position where there's, you know, there's no more pass or fail, or in other words, there's no dividing line. Rather, there are various levels of maturity, ability, potential. The same is true for our moral standards in society. We are loath to say that someone is evil or bad, or what they do is evil or bad. Instead, we describe their environment as a disadvantaged, or we seek to blame society as a whole for the evil committed by one person. The worst thing to be in our world today is intolerant, judgmental, or critical because this means that you have set up a dividing line from which you are making value judgments. And that is unacceptable because the new mantra of our society is that we must strive to accept everyone and everything exactly as they are. And we're using the court system to make sure that nobody makes a value judgment. This does not bode well for Christians because our entire faith system is based on crucial judgments and choices where we decide one way or another, we decide one fact over another, one truth over another, it's what we do. In a past article in a periodical called Vigil Magazine, Dr. Hugo McCord, long gone now, but I kept this article here, he highlighted this very issue when he talked about the dividing line that is constantly drawn between God's people and other people throughout the Bible. Over and over again, God has comp compelled people to use the free will that they have been given in order to make decisions concerning himself and concerning his will. So this evening I'd like to briefly review these lines, these dividing lines as they've been established throughout history and draw some modern day conclusions from our study. First of all, I'd like to say that whether a person agrees or not, likes it or not, finds it fair or not, this is not the point here. The point is that the Bible does draw dividing lines and it asks people to line up on one side or the other. And it has done this from the very beginning. For example, Adam had to choose to eat the fruit or not eat the fruit and suffer the consequences. Noah had to build the boat or stay on dry land. Abraham had to go to Canaan or stay home. Moses had to face the Pharaoh or remain in hiding. Esther had to speak up or remain silent. Joseph had to take Mary as his wife or divorce her. Matthew had to follow Jesus or stay in the tax booth. Even Jesus had to go to the cross or return to Nazareth where he began his earthly life. Dividing lines, all dividing lines. People had to line up on one side or the other. So God draws a line in the sand for each and every person, sooner or later, and He asks them to stand with Him and, 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 and be with Him or reject His offer by their choice. Because we accept God's will in our life by choosing it or we reject it by choosing it. As I said before, this principle, this scenario is repeated over and over again in the Bible. Now the people I've just mentioned and their choices, these were special cases. Special cases because they were asked to serve God and His purpose in special ways. 
And so their dividing lines were unique to their situation and God's call. After all, God doesn't call everybody to build an ark. God doesn't call everybody to be the earthly parent of the Messiah. These are pretty unique things. These were special one-time choices for these people, a one-time dividing line. However, there's another dividing line that appears over and over again that isn't just for leaders and prophets, but is for everybody. The basic dividing line that has always served to separate those who were saved from those who were lost, those who were accepted by God from those who would be rejected by Him. You could say that this is the bottom line as far as dividing lines are considered. The Bible refers to this essential dividing line as baptism. Baptism. From the very earliest times when God began to communicate with man concerning his salvation, time of Noah for example, to the very last communication about his salvation, the time of Jesus giving the command to his apostles, baptism in one form or another has served as the physical and historical dividing line between being saved and being lost. Allow me to list some of the examples of this. Let's talk about Noah's baptism, for example. Peter talks about it in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 20 and 21. Peter compares the salvation of Noah and his family through the watery flood to the baptism that believers receive in his day. He writes, when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water and corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. His point here is that the dividing line between life and death for Noah, just like the Christians of Peter's day, the dividing line was the water. For Noah, those who were saved were above the water in the boat, and the unsaved were drowned. For Peter, those who were saved had their consciences cleansed by the water of baptism, and the unsaved remain in their guilt and their condemnation. And so regardless of the century, water was the dividing line between saved and unsaved. One was a baptism through the flood, the other a baptism by immersion but both produced salvation for their recipients and was understood this way by them. And I need to repeat that. We're not, we're not putting the meaning on it now. They understood that this is what that meant during their time. Another example, the Israelites, their baptism. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul talks about this. The Israelites, as they escaped from Egyptian bondage, did not consider themselves saved until after they passed through the parted waters of the Red Sea. Because before, they, you know, before the waters opened up to let them go, they were goners in their mind, we're done. So before they passed through, they were very afraid of death. In Exodus chapter 14, verses 10 to 12, it is written here, as Pharaoh drew near, the sons of Israel looked, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they became very frightened. So the sons of Israel cried out to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, is it because there were no graves in Egypt that you've taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you dealt with us in this way, bringing us out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we spoke to you in Egypt, saying, leave us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. They, they thought this is the end, we're going to, we're going to die. But note Moses' answer to them regarding the dividing line of their salvation. Again, Exodus, just one verse down, verse 13. But Moses said to the people, do not fear. Stand by and see the salvation of the Lord, which He will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you will never see them again forever. This is the experience Paul is referring to when he talks about the Israelites being baptized into Moses 
in 1 Corinthians 10 verses 1 and 2, he says, For I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Paul compares the definitive point where the Israelites were saved from the Egyptians, that baptism into Moses through the cloud and the sea, he compares that to the definitive point where Christians are saved, baptism into Christ through immersion in water. His warning to the Corinthians was that even though the Israelites were safe, they went back to disbelief and idolatry and they consequently died in the desert. The Corinthians, uh, he says, uh, should be careful not to repeat their mistake. Now the point I make for our lesson is that there was a definite point, a dividing line between safety and loss. For the Israelite, it was the baptism in the Red Sea as it parted around them to let them go through. For Paul's readers, it was the baptism of Jesus that allowed them to pass safely from death to life. So those who refused to pass through the cloud and sea, they were surely killed. And it was definitely a dividing line for life or for death. Another example, another example, the baptism of John. John the Baptist was the last of the Old Testament prophets and his particular task was to prepare the people for the coming of the Messiah. Luke chapter one, verse 17. His baptism was the dividing line uh, between those who accepted his message and were preparing for the appearance of Christ and those who did not. And I read from Luke 7, 29-30, it says, all the people and the tax collectors justified God, being baptized in the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, not being baptized by him. How did they reject? Did they heckle him? Did they write an article about him? Did they denounce him when they were at the temple? Is that how they rejected him? No, it just says right here, uh, 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 the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, not being baptized by him. The baptism was the rejection. The baptism was the dividing line. So note that the Bible says that dividing line was the baptism of John. Not, not, not the intention to be baptized, not the agreement that John's baptism was like a good thing, not even the belief that John's message was true. Acceptance or rejection of God's counsel or God's will, that was divided at baptism. That was the dividing line between those who did what God wanted them to do and those who refused to do what God wanted them to do. This is the reason Jesus himself was baptized by John. He knew where the dividing line was. Another example, if you don't mind, just to make sure here, and that would be the baptism of Jesus. Let's go to uh, Matthew, shall we? Uh, in um, Matthew chapter 28, familiar passage, of course, Matthew 28, 18. And Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And then of course, a, a, you know, a comparable passage. We usually read both of these together in Mark 16. Uh, verse 16, it says, he who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. So the baptism of Jesus, this is the final dividing line established by God. Immersion in water in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins and the reception of the Holy Spirit is the true dividing line of which all others pointed to or were a shadow of. Peter rose up and he preached to thousands who had congregated in Jerusalem for the Pentecost feast. And he drew a dividing line that has remained since and will remain until uh, Jesus returns. In Acts chapter two, again, I'm reading familiar passages, things that we know, things that we've heard before, things that uh, establish 
uh, in our minds this dividing line, but I'll read it once again in chapter two, verse 38. Peter says to the crowd who has asked him, what must we do to be saved? And he says, uh, repent and each of, let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to Himself. And with many other words He solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. So then those who had received His word were baptized. And that day there were added about 3,000 uh, 3, 3, souls. So on that day, 3,000 people responded to that message and they aligned themselves with Jesus Christ. How? Well, through baptism. There were more than 3,000 people there. There wasn't just 3,000 people there. There were many thousands of people, but only 3,000 made the decision to cross the line and be with Jesus. These people, along with so many others before them and since them, to this very day, understood that baptism is the dividing line between receiving and not receiving the blessings of salvation from God. I've mentioned some of these. The dividing line between destruction and life for the people of Noah's day. Slavery and freedom in Moses' day. Guilt or forgiveness at John's calling and preaching, salvation or condemnation by Jesus. These are some of the references, but there's so many more that reinforce the idea that baptism is the dividing line established by God for those He accepts and those He rejects, for those who have His blessings and those who don't. More examples, just in case we're not sure. In Acts 22:16. A, 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 a dividing line between those whose sins are washed away and those whose sins are not washed away. Acts 2.38 and 5.32, those who possess the Holy Spirit and those who don't possess the Holy Spirit. Romans 6.3 and Galatians 3.27, those who are in Christ and those who are not in Christ. John 3.5 and Colossians 1.13, those who are in the kingdom of God and those who are not in the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, those who are in the body of Christ and those who are not in the body of Christ. Why does he say this in 1 Corinthians? By one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Every single example that I have just quoted, that I have just referred to, every one, the basis of the teaching in every one of these is that baptism is the dividing line between these two things. So the Bible is very clear on this issue. Baptism separates for all eternity those who will share eternal life with Christ from those who will endure eternal suffering without Him. This is not a, a popular idea in this day of political correctness, that some are definitely saved and some are definitely lost, and that there is an unmistakable line that divides them forever. Not popular. Not easy, not comforting, but true. And if true moves us to consider and reconsider some important questions for ourselves. Now, you know, one of the basic things about preaching, you can't preach everything you know about a topic in 25 minutes. Somebody may be sitting there and say, well, he hasn't mentioned faith at all. Well, of course I haven't. I'm assuming you know that. Well, he hasn't mentioned repentance. What about repentance? Well, yeah, okay. The scriptures that I've cited all mention that. What about the confessing? I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. What about that? You didn't mention that. Well, no, I'm thinking you know this. I'm trying to emphasize the physical, historical moment, dividing line. Because you see, belief, this is a gradual thing. You don't wake up one morning and fully believe everything you know and believe. No, it's a gradual, it's a process. And repentance, the same thing. I've been a Christian nearly 40 years and you know what? I'm still repenting. Every day I, I've, I've discovered a new angle of something that makes me repent about that thing. Oh Lord, I, I'm sorry, I didn't see how untruthful I was becoming about this particular issue here. 
I'm always repenting. We all are always repenting. And confessing, we are always confessing in some way or another. So I'm assuming you know this. And I'm not talking about these issues. I'm not talking about this process. I'm talking about the historical moment in time where one thing is divided for another and the Lord has given us this information in the scriptures and it's fairly clear that baptism is that historical moment. So if we understand this, then we ought to ask ourselves some question. First question, is it okay to establish this line? I mean, is, just, is this just a Church of Christ thing? Is this just the Mike Mazzalongo, the preacher thing? You know? Well, the answer to that is yes. Why? Because the Bible establishes it. People are afraid to be called narrow-minded, legalistic, uncaring, judgmental. People who accuse us of this do so because they don't want to deal with the line that God has established, so they attack the messenger. Brothers and sisters, the line, it's already there. It's very clear, it's very defined. We are simply taking our stand on the side that God commands all men and all women to take, and that is obedience. The teaching that a person is saved only when they are immersed or baptized in Jesus' name, as I mentioned before, this is not a Church of Christ thing. Eating at every meeting, okay, that's a Church of Christ thing. Okay, but baptism as the dividing line, that's a Bible thing. You see what I'm saying? That's a Bible thing. When people reject or ridicule this, they reject the word, not us. Our job is to keep the line where it is and not move it around to include some that we think ought to make it. So instead of changing the people, let's change the line. Yeah, we're not allowed to do that. Now, another question, okay. Is it okay to verify someone's baptism before accepting them as a Christian? Or before accepting them as members of Christ's body, the church? Is that okay? Answer, well, yes, of course it is. Paul the Apostle did this very thing with a group of brethren at Ephesus in Acts chapter 19. He learned from them that they had been baptized correctly by immersion in water, but for the wrong reason. They were baptized into John the Baptist's baptism long after it had been replaced by Jesus' baptism. So he questioned their baptism because he knew it was the dividing line. And when he learned that it was done incorrectly, what did he do? He rebaptized all of them again, this time for the right reasons. These men that we talk about in Ephesians, they were sincere men. They were zealous for God. They were spiritually minded and they thought that they were okay. They did everything asked of them. But they were, they were not okay. Only when Paul rebaptized them were they in line with God's command. We don't have the right to change the line to suit our feelings or our traditions but we do have the right to point out where the line is to those who are mistaken. I'm sure that the Ephesians that Paul rebaptized did not criticize him for caring enough to make sure that they were okay. It's a very simple question. Someone that we don't know comes here, for example, with all the right intentions and sincerity and you know, they know what's going on. And at some point they say, well, we, we'd like to, you know, I'd like to, I'd like to be a member here. And usually one of the elders or the ministers, if they don't know the person at all, they'll say, well, you know what, Let, let's have a little conversation. Tell me about yourself. Where did you go to church before? And how were you converted? Tell me, tell me about your conversion, how you became a Christian. Those are okay questions. If the person said, well, you know, I was uh, sleeping one night and I had a dream and in my dream Jesus said, follow me, and then the next day, poof, I decided I was going to be one of his disciples and here I am. I believe I'd have a Bible study with that man. 
If somebody says, well, you know, when I was in our youth group and I was 14 years old, I remember at camp and uh, you know, uh, after one of the lessons, I had a Bible study with the youth minister and he immersed me in water and you know, I've been faithful ever since. And so, okay. I'm not going to ask you, have you overcome all of your mistakes? Do you still bite your nails? You know, I'm not going to ask you, <laughs> you know, uh, do you swear once in a while? Have you given up smoking? You know, I'm not going to ask you all of these questions. I just want to know, how did you become a Christian? Do you understand where the line is? Another question, is it okay to check my own baptism? You know, some people think that they're being traitors to their own families or being childish if they re-examine their own baptism. They believe incorrectly that by re-examining their baptism, they are rejecting or condemning family members or former teachers who originally taught them. What they're really doing is searching for the truth and then obeying the truth, and here's the key word, and then obeying the truth for themselves. It's called being an adult. A lot of us are adults because we have children and we go to work and we got pension plans you know, and we're adults. You know, but we're not adults spiritually. We haven't grown up spiritually. These are the type of things that spiritual grown-ups do. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. John chapter 14, verse 15. And so one, if we learn that Jesus' word is in conflict with what we've been taught originally, then we have to go with what Jesus taught, not what my aunt taught me at Sunday school. It's not a question of loving family less, it's a question of loving Jesus more. I mean, if we don't do what's right, there's absolutely no hope to convince those we love to do it either. We simply share in their mistake. Jesus also said, what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Matthew 16, 26. The person who's telling you that you're being foolish or childish for re-examining your baptism, that's Satan talking to you, that's not Jesus. That's not Jesus who's talking to you. Anything that Satan can do to block you from obeying the Lord, he's going to do it at any time in your life. Your soul is the most precious possession and examining everything that affects it is wise and spiritual. If your baptism is okay, then you can match your experience to the New Testament. You can even undergo Paul and the apostles examination and not change because you know that you are okay. You know, I've heard people say, well, I'm just too old for that. Your soul doesn't have an age. Your body may have an age, 25, 45, 85. Your body may have an age. Your spirit doesn't have an age. Your spirit is never too old to do what's right. Your spirit is never too old to obey. Your body and the pride that your flesh has may feel, well, I can't do that. What would people think if I changed my mind on this or I did that? If I imagine I'm, I'm, I'm 74 years old and I'm being rebaptized, you know, people are going to think I'm crazy. Well, who, who's going to think you're crazy? Not the Lord. Not the angels in heaven. Not other Christians. Who does that leave? Well, it doesn't matter who that leaves because that's just about everybody that we're going to be with one day. No age to your soul. No age limit on doing what's right. On the other hand, if you haven't lived up to God's dividing line, then you're defensive, you're unsure, you have a nagging doubt, you may feel uncomfortable. So if that's your experience, then you should seriously question and reconsider your baptism. I'm not doing this to try to get people to doubt their salvation. I'm doing this to make sure that everyone is confident in their salvation. That's the point. Now, brothers and sisters, as I close out this evening, I, I want you to know 
As I said, I'm not here to make you doubt. I'm here to establish the idea in your minds and in your hearts that the Bible itself establishes a dividing line between lost and saved. And baptism by its language and its content and its intent is that dividing line. Whether we like it or not, that's where the dividing line is. So please accept this teaching from the Lord and obey it if you need to as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.